Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Tonight in our Wednesday class, we continue our discussion on the letters to the seven churches and focus on the letter to the church in Smyrna from Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Let's listen in. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time together to study your word, and we pray, Lord, that as we do get into our study this night, that you would grant us your spirit, uh, teach us to trust you and and cling to you uh, through the promises that we read here, and teach us to repent uh, when we are convicted. We do pray tonight, Lord, uh, that you would hear our prayers and answer them according to your will, and we thank you, Father, that you have promised to do it. Uh, We pray tonight, Lord, for Tom as he received the bad news of being laid off today. We ask you, Father, to grant him wisdom as to what to do next. Uh, We pray for both uh, for him and for everyone, uh, all 23 people who were laid off today. Uh, Lord, give them wisdom and direction as to where to go. Uh, Open up doors and opportunities for them uh, as you see fit. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide him with uh, wisdom and with um, everything that he needs. We pray for um, uh, Joyce as she's continuing to heal. We pray, God, that uh, she's very sick, actually. We we pray, Lord, that the doctors would be able to figure out how to treat this thyroid issue, that uh, she would gain more energy, that you would uh, give her your strength, Lord, and we pray uh, that you would be with her through this radiation treatment that she's going to go through. Uh, We pray that it would uh, be successful and she would be healed. Uh, We continue to pray for Marv. We ask you, God, to grant him healing. We thank you that he's doing better at home, and we pray for uh, the continued healing of him and encouragement to him, Lord. Keep him positive and strong. We pray for Rogelio and Delphine as they are uh, suffering from cancer. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would grant them healing. Watch over them with your mercy. Uh, Give them uh, your strength and teach them to trust in your son through all of this. Finally, we give you thanks this night, Lord, uh, for Jeff and Melinda and uh, Avery, as Avery will finally be adopted this week. We pray, God, that that would go smoothly, and we thank you uh, for the blessing that she is to their family and the blessing they are to her. Uh, Bless us this night, Father, and let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are in two, huh? Yeah. John. Uh, Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Do we have any follow-up questions? Any confusion? Any um, Anything from last time, two weeks ago now, that, that you want to touch on before we move on? I just don't understand the, the book. Okay, well, all right. It's it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. Yeah, there's a lot here. Um, That's why we'll go slowly, piece by piece. That's all right. The the letters you, well, I guess you call them the letters. Mm -hmm. Um, They're rather short. They're more like postcards. Yes, the postcards. That would probably be a better, the postcard from the angel to the church in Ephesus or something like this. Yeah, good. They're not like Ephesians or the other ones. No, no, and it's it's partially because they're part of a larger book. Um, they're little, yeah, they're kind of like little notes to each church. Jesus knows what's happening there, and he has something to say to each of these seven churches. Uh, but what he has to say to them needs to be understood in light of the whole. So it goes out as a, as a big single letter to everyone. Yeah, but it's not. I mean, this is a shorter note to Ephesus than we have in Ephesians, for example. Right. Yeah. Right? I mean, like the one we did on Sunday was like three verses. Uh, yeah, four. Yeah, uh, that's right. We'll do that today too, and go slowly. Yeah. Anyone else? The, the letters are really kind of like a setup for the rest of the book. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Because if you just took the letters by themselves, okay, they're important, but they don't have the same impact. Right. As in the entirety of that book. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It has yeah. To be all together. You need to read the whole thing in light of each other. Absolutely. Right. Right. Good. Anyone else? All right, let's do it. Uh, can somebody read verses 8 through 11 for us, please? Got it. Thank you. And then to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. And I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blas- blasphemy of them which say, they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou 
shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, and be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so where we are writing to Smyrna at this time, what is, or here's a few things about Smyrna. It is the modern day Izmir. Does anyone know who, where Izmir is? Turkey. Cheater. Uh, yes, it's in Turkey um, on the Aegean Sea. Uh, Smyrna had a well-known stadium, which is always going to be bad news for the Christians. <laughs> uh, library and the largest public theater in Asia Minor. The first city in ancient Rome to build a temple to the Dea Roma, who was the goddess of Rome. Uh, the only province of the Roman Empire to have more than one center of the emperor cult. So multiple of those. Uh, they built a temple to Tiberius in AD 26, for what it's worth. And a very large Jewish population. Okay, So this is going to be two things working against the Christian church here, uh, as we'll see in a moment. Um, one is the imperial cult has a rather large influence there if you have two, at least two temples. And that the Christians never do well with the imperial cult, right? Because they're worshiping Jesus as Lord and not Caesar. So uh, that's always going to be a problem for them. But as we'll see in this letter, they also are going to have a problem uh, with the Jews, apparently. Uh, the Jews of the city are not going to be welcoming to them, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, how does Christ identify himself? The first and the last, right? All right, what is that? What, what is that? And that's the, well, that's not all that. First and the last and the he who was, I should say. Dead. Dead. Now alive. But now alive. Okay, so what is the first and the last? What does that mean? <clears throat> yeah, it could be an, it could be an identifier of him with God. Remember earlier, God the Father in verse, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So it could be Jesus saying, I'm identified with that guy. A divine character name. And there, there could be something to that. It also could be sort of a description of uh, his ministry, of who he is for us. So I am the the author and perfecter, to use the language of Hebrews, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who initiates our faith, and he's the one who brings it to the completion. He's the beginning and the end, the beginning and the goal, something like this. Um, it could be all of that, too, wrapped up together. Go ahead, Dave. Well, in looking at it as the first, I would say that, look back to the resurrection. He's the first. First born of the dead, of the right? Dead. Paul, so first Corinthians. First. And then if you look at the last, he's where we're headed. Yes. He's the one who's coming back. So his, He's the whole purpose. Yeah, right. So that, that very well could be. Um, uh, but the resurrection language is throughout. And the resurrection language is, of, yeah, right. Revelation, so you know, that's why I would take it that way. And it's right away. It's right the first away. and the last is put in the right next to, or juxtaposed with, uh, the one who died, died and came back to life. Yeah. Now, I think, we mentioned this last week, or two weeks ago, I, I think that the Christological indicator, uh, the name Jesus gives himself, I like to say Christological indicator because it sounds very smart, uh, the name Jesus gives himself here is going to matter for the letter. So it's going to kind of set the tone. If he's speaking of himself as the one who has died but come back to life, that's going to be what, what kind of, what does that convey? What does that make you think? as you hear that of Jesus? Is that, a, is that a scary picture? Is it a comforting picture? Is it a uh, encouraging? Like, what, what does that do? What do you think? I what does it do for you? Hard. I think so, yeah. It's our hope. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. You listen. Yeah. I, he has things to say. That's things right. Tell us. Yeah, I, I think so. So this is, and they're all going to kind of do that, especially when we get to, to Pergamum, uh, the one who has a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Now, now you're scared, right? But, but yeah, there's, there's a hope, there's a comfort here. And so the one who rose again from the dead, the only one who's done it eternally at this point, uh, is speaking. It's, it's time to listen. Go ahead, Dave. You're, you're gonna... Well, Dave doesn't even have to raise his hand. Do you all notice this? Dave just, like his eyebrows do something, and I'm like, he's going to say something. Yeah. But if you go to... Um, 
what is it? The last part of verse 10. Be faithful even to the yeah. point of death. So in that part of the, the whole letter, he's warning them of what may come. But at the first part, he starts out by saying, I came back. Correct. So and it's a linking of the promise of the resurrection with what's going to happen to them. And linking of the promise of the resurrection to who Jesus is yes. for them. So this is going to be a letter of hope to those who are faced with death. Don't forget who you belong to. I'm the one who defeated death for you. See, so that's why does he use ten days? We'll get there. We'll get there. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, that is a it's a good question because it's one of those that. All right, is that literal? We'll, we'll get there in a second. Uh, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. What does this mean? Blessed. Yeah. What is what is the difference between? He knows what's coming. But yeah. He also knows what's going to come after. Yes. So there's there's something more to look forward to than whatever's going on in this world. And notice, you know, that's a really interesting way of putting it, Ron, because what Jesus is, I didn't think of it like that, but in light of the letter, this makes a lot of sense, that, that Jesus is saying to them, look, I know you're poverty, I know you're poor, I know your current circumstances, but they're nothing compared to the riches you have sort of eternally. Uh, the end that is promised to you, which is basically yours already, because I've promised it to you. Um, you are wealthy in light of that. In other words, you are ruling with Christ as it is. I mean, it's very interesting in Ephesians, when it talks about us ruling with Christ, us being seated with him in heavenly realms. Ephesians or Colossians, one of those two. Um, it's present tense stuff. <coughs> and I go, wait a minute, no I'm not. I'm sitting in Smyrna. And life here sucks. You know, this is not the heavenly realms. And yet at the same time, the promise is so certain that it's as good as gold. Does that make sense? It's as good as done. Christ is the beginning and the end. Baptism. Think of baptism. When you're baptized, the end is given to you. It's the initiation into the faith. It's when Christ saves you. But it's also the promise of, and now it's complete. I've given you everything. God doesn't work in halves. He doesn't work in percentages. He doesn't say, all right, baptism, you got 25%. Now 75% will be completed on the day of judgment. No, it's 100% of Jesus is given. I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who has given you everything in my resurrection and in my promise. See, And so this idea of, yeah, you're poor in light of the world, but you're actually wealthy. Why? Because you have Christ, and Christ has the cattle of a thousand hills or something like these lines, you know. Um, very comforting stuff in light of the poverty and the persecution that they're facing. The yeah. least of you is the greatest in the eyes of... Sure, sure, because the world looks at you and says, really? Oh, this is great. I was just reading, you guys ever read... I hope the answer to this is no, actually. You guys ever read Friedrich Nietzsche before? Yeah, have you read Nietzsche? It's, it's not boring. Uh, <laughs> I was reading his book called The Antichrist. I figured it could come in useful for this revelation study. <laughs> so I'm on the elliptical yesterday healing my knee, you know, reading Nietzsche. It's a very strange world I live in. And Nietzsche says, uh, the problem with Christianity, the real downfall of it is it takes pity on the weak. Uh, the problem with Christianity is that it loves the weak and the downtrodden, and that's what's holding us back. What we need to embrace is, I, I forget the word he used in the thing I read, but the, the, the idea of the ubermensch, the superman, now uh, this is Hitler really you catches on to this. Yeah, so we can, not human engineering yet, but sort of human ability. The reason we're not more powerful is because we keep caring about these impotent, weak people. Be done with them. We'll eliminate them, let them die off. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, and that's what Nietzsche would say. And the problem with Christianity is you ca they care. They have pity, and pity is not a virtue. Um, it, it's, and so... It's a very interesting thing that when the world looks at, and Nietzsche sort of captures this picture, that the world says, look, that's pathetic and weak. You worship a dude who was crucified. Really? Think about this. He spent time with needy, weak people. If he was the god of the universe, it would have been better. I mean, he's really sort of, I mean, this really is always the critique of Jesus, right? If he really is God, why isn't the world a better place? And really, he's just sort of saying what everyone's thinking. Um, and so here, when the world looks at the church and says it's weak and impoverished, when Christ looks at the church, he says, oh, but I see you as rich. I see you as wealthy because I love you and you have all of my promises and all of God's gifts. And so, so Christ's view 
is hidden from us, but it's proclaimed to us, and so we cling to that. That's this great stuff. Yeah. And it's fascinating, and I don't know whether uh, I haven't really read Nietzsche, but I read excerpts here and there. But the the Jews really always claimed that you had uh, Jesus was. Um, um, begotten ultimately in the past from David, I mm-hmm. believe, and that was the line through, mm-hmm. through David or from David. Yep. And and the Jews said, well, he's not the Messiah. Christ is not the Messiah because he's not a king the way we understand it to be. Right, right. Um, and maybe that's what uh, Nietzsche is, is. I've heard a lot of people talk about him and some take it as a philosophy and he's he's making us think and parroting parroting to us what what he wants us to think um maybe he's just making statements i, I don't know but no nietzsche's nietzsche's advocating for what he says he's yeah advocating. nietzsche's advocating yeah and it, but it would be and it, it, it's a similar argument I, I think you're on the right track it's a similar argument against christ that says if you're the son of david do this it, what are the uh, what are the pharisees and sadducees say when he's on the cross i if you really are the Son of God, come down. Yes. Prove your power, right? right? And and Nietzsche is going to say something similar, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Although then he's going to deny the existence of God, so it's a little different. Yeah. In my defense, I read that a long. That's <laughs> that's good. That's... <laughs> but what what what, what strikes me, um, also a long time ago. Um, okay, I won't talk about um, <clears throat> my brother. Um, told me that he he was a member of a religious organization, Christian. Um, he was earning grace for the world. He was earning grace, bringing grace in, in the world. Hmm. And um, it led to a number of discussions. And, and kind of, this is the point that, that I think that Jesus is trying to make here: is that with, with my with with some people, you get grace like at ten cc's of grace. Mm-hmm. You know. Yep. Mm-hmm. And. And, and we teach, no, you get all the grace. Yeah. You can reject the grace if you want, but you get all the grace. Right. You don't get 10 cc's of it. That's right. The, this is the, the issue with the Catholics, and, and I think we would even say it this way. It's not, grace isn't something, how would I say it this way? Well, by definition, grace is not earned. So how do you get to earn the remaining percent? No, in, in fact, uh, grace, grace isn't, you have to earn it. see, this is the thing, the, the whole conversation is a little off because, Grace isn't something we get so much as it is the attitude of God towards us. Does that make sense? So grace isn't a thing. The CCs is a great illustration. It's not something that's pumped into you, but rather it's God's attitude towards you. And God isn't kind of gracious to you, but now you got to get it right so he's totally gracious to you. God is gracious to you in Christ completely because God doesn't work in percentages, right? So, yeah, that's I, that's a great way of saying it. CCs, the one I've heard is... Um, it's like filling up with gas at the gas station, right? And you fill up, and then you live your life, and it depletes, and so you got to go back for more. There, there is now. There is a place for this sort of the big technical languages infused grace. I mean, the grace does kind of empower us to do things, and God en- enables us. We might say it that way, but I prefer the language of God graciously enabling us to carry out His will, as opposed to saying. I've got the grace down in my heart, and that's why I do this. Does that make sense? Because we want to always locate everything in, in Christ, basically, and not in us, because then otherwise we're just fearful or boasting. Um, so, yeah, it, that, I like that. It's CC's, I'm stealing that one, too. No, that's good. Um, bringing grace into the world, that's... Boy, that's delightful. Okay. Um, yeah, but so, so uh, here again... Notice Jesus' words of gospel to this church. You are rich. We don't feel rich. doesn't feel. It's what he said. Cling to the word, okay? Riches of poverty, and poverty, yet rich. Yeah. Yes. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but they are not. But they are a synagogue of Satan. <sighs> okay. Is Jesus being anti-Semitic here? No, because as he says it, he incidentally is a resurrected Jew. So he's not being anti-Semitic here, okay? Uh, What is he talking about? If somebody could look up for me John 8, and someone else look up for me um, Romans 
9, 6 through 8. And I will give you the John 8 verses here in a second. Can someone do Romans 9 for me? Thanks. Yeah. See, John 7, John 8. And I would like you to read 30, it's a, it's a bit long, but that's okay. Uh, 31 through 44. Actually, 31 through 45. I can do that if no one else wants to. Thank you, Tom. All right. So I think we want to read Jesus' words here about the synagogue of Satan in light of what goes on in John chapter 8. Okay. Um, He's not saying all Jews across the board are part of this gathering of Satan, synagogue, people who gather together. It's a place of gathering. Sin, S-Y-N, sort of a prefix of with something like this. Uh, we belong to the Missouri Synod, people who walk with one another. That's what synod means. Or synod, if it's ever pronounced on television, it's, it's synod. Uh, but people who walk together, synagogue, people who gather together. Who is the synagogue of Satan specifically that Jesus speaks of here? Uh, John 8. Yeah, go for it. Uh, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants. Yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. Mm. You are going. You are doing the things your own father does. Uh, Forty-five. Okay. Yeah. We are not illegitimate children. They protested. The only father we have is God Himself. Jesus said to him, "If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but He sent me. Why is my language not clear to you?" because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, because because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. All right. So, uh, what's what's going on here? Jesus is t- talking to some of the Jews. It's interesting. It says the Jews who had believed him uh, at the beginning. So these aren't necessarily people who are opposed to him, but Jesus kind of puts them in their place and says, "Look, you guys are all slaves to sin. They they don't like to hear it." But then he goes on to say, "You're not doing the things Abraham did." Well, what does Abraham do? finally trusted God. Well, he believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness, right? He listens to God. And these guys are trying to usurp the throne. They're not listening to God as he's the word made flesh right in front of them, right? And so and so he says, you're not actually on Abraham's team. Whose team are you on? The devil's. You're your children of the father. The, your, your father is the devil. Thank you, Jesus. This is not the Jesus with the shepherd over his shoulder or the sheep over his shoulders that we talked about a few weeks ago. You know, but what is it about the Jews here that is that is angering Jesus? What are they trying to do? Jesus says they're trying to do what? Well, this couple with some other passages, they're really claiming that their status before God is based on their lineage from Abraham. Yes, but there's something specific they're trying to do to Jesus. Oh, yeah, kill him. Kill him. They're trying to kill him, right? Because their father is the devil. And the devil is the father of lies, and he's a murderer. 
And here, the father of lies is seeking to murder the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so, and so what does this, how does this help us understand um, Revelation? What's going on in Revelation is here you have in Smyrna a synagogue, most likely of people who are persecuting the church. And the church is the body of Christ. So when you attack the church, you attack Christ. All right? You're opposed to the church, you're opposed to Christ. So to call them a synagogue of Satan is to say, not that all Jews are of the devil, but the, the point here is these Jews specifically are attacking the work of God. They're attacking the people of the gospel. They're attacking the true children of Abraham who believe. Does that make sense? And so they're on that team. Same way with the prophets, right? They're sure. The prophets. It's absolutely right. Uh, Jesus says, You, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and the prophets' sons, or something like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, this, is, this is constantly the way. And so you're just seeing the pattern sort of continue there in Smyrna. All right? Make sense? Okay. Uh, one other passage I want to read here Romans 9. There's, there's no more difficult. I mean, you think, you think Revelation is tough. Romans 9, 10, 11 are the most difficult texts in all of the New Testament. If you want my opinion, that's correct. Uh, those ones are hard, um, and, but I would like to get into them anyway. So, okay, this yeah. is uh, Romans chapter 9, what was it, 6 through 8? Yes, sir. Okay. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary... It is through Isaac that their offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. All right, so it's faith. Wow, that's confident. Yeah, that's, All right, so, so the children of Isaac. So how many, na think of uh, Abraham, how many natural children does he have? Three. <laughs> well, let's see. Hold on, I should have known the answer before I asked the question. Um, There's two that are significant. In the yeah, two, right? And they are Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael. Is Ishmael the son of the promise? No. no. Is he a legitimate son of Abraham's? Absolutely, yeah. But he's not the child of promise. The child of promise is Isaac. Isaac is associated with faith, all that kind of stuff. So the idea here is, who are the children of Abraham? Those who believe in Christ. Not those who are descended from Abraham by their blood. It's not a lineage thing. Okay. Uh, the point here being, um, if you have people who are of the lineage of Abraham, who are opposed to the gospel, they're on the devil's side. But isn't Jesus in the lineage of Abraham? Yeah, but he's not opposed to the Jesus. Right, right. right. It, 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 yeah, the, the flip side is, if you are of the lineage of Abraham and you have faith in Christ, then yes, you're a child of Abraham because you believe in Christ. Right. But in the New Testament, child of Abraham is sort of, I guess you could say it this way, technical language for believer, someone who believes in Christ. So Jews and Gentiles are both children of Abraham because of faith. But, but what they're claiming is that Abraham is their father, ergo, yeah. we are the true Correct. Be yeah. Right, exactly. There's some sort of lineage, the hands, like royalty, it's hands, a, hands right. them something exactly. that, they, that they just have because they are with him. So and this is why they're so offended when Jesus says the truth will set you free. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're Abraham's kids. What do you mean? We're, we're free. He's like, no, because you don't believe. That's why John the Baptist's baptism is so offensive. Because he's baptizing Jews. The baptism for, for John was a... Um, well, baptism in the first century there was this sort of... You take Gentiles who want to convert to Judaism and you baptize them to sort of recapitulate the passing through the water and the Red Sea and all this kind of stuff. And John was coming and saying, and the Jews need to be baptized too because they're not people of God simply because they're Jews. And that was very offensive. Um, that's why people were very angry with what John was doing. So kind of interesting. Okay. Good. All right. What does he see here that he likes and he doesn't like? He's, he knows their works. Um... Really not a whole lot. No, and so it's, what's interesting here is he doesn't say, as he'll say in Pergamum, I have some things against you. Um, but there is a sense here in which there's a fear. Remember we talked about this last week, that, or two weeks ago, 
that the, the sins, the bad things, are going to sort of build on one another. So in Ephesus, the sin was you've lost your first love. And when you lose your first love, what's going to start happening, and we, we said what that means is they're, they're steering away from Christ. They're not listening to the word of God. They're starting to be tempted by other things. The serpent is sounding a little more attractive to them right now. Once that happens, fear sets in. So fear follows from turning from God's word, from listening to something else, from trusting something else. Okay? Think of it in terms of, of death. Do Christians need to fear death? No. Why? They're already saved. That's right. Because the one who is the first and the last who died and rose again is our God and he will raise us up and death cannot harm us. We'll talk about that at the very end. Uh, but once you stop thinking, once you're on your deathbed and you stop thinking about Christ and the promises and you start thinking about how bad it will hurt or you start thinking of, well, is there really an afterlife? Boy, I don't know. Is God still with me? I'm in a lot of pain right now. Suddenly, what sets in? Fear. Fear. That's why you want someone by your side who's reading you scripture passages and promises of Jesus when you're dying because there's that fear of or the fear that the devil likes to give you is, it, well, you weren't good enough. You're not going to make this thing. It, that, those promises are for the good. You're not going to, you, you know, that kind of stuff. My grandma, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before. My grandma, she's 89 and she just wants to die. Um, and that sounds like a terrible thing, but it's kind of funny when I call her and say, Grandma, like two weeks ago, Grandma, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. I hope I don't have another one. <laughs> Grandma, well, look, Bobby, because oh, she's the only one who can call me that. I have been, I have lived 89 years. All of my friends are dead, and I just want to see Jesus. That's what she says. I just want to see Jesus. There's a difference there. She looks at death, and she's not afraid of it. My, she won't ever watch this. She doesn't get the end. My grandma's a hypochondriac. She's the healthiest person in our whole Steakin family, and she's been convinced she's been ill for decades. She's in the hospital more than anyone. She's the only healthy one, you know. She's not Jewish. You've got yeah. to make it funny for her, like when she's at a memorial service. Thank you. Hardly worth going home. This yeah, that's right. Funny. What did Frosty Godfrey this morning says, when my, when my father-in-law was older and dying, we'd say, Frank, how you doing? And he goes, well, not buying any green bananas, I'll tell you that much. That's a great line. It's a good line. Uh, but my grandma's that way. She, so she's like, she kind of is funny about it, but she's serious. She's like, I just want to see the Lord. I just want to see, the, I want to be in the presence of Christ. And she goes, I don't even know why I'm here. I'll tell you why she, well, who knows. But the other day, she has a new lady coming to clean her house because she can't do it anymore. And the girl's in her 20s, you know, had a kid when she was 16 or something like that. No, she's in her mid-30s. Had a kid when she was 16. The kid's almost 19, 20 now. Um, and she says to my grandma, you know, I want to go to church with you. And went to church with my grandma and sat there with her arm around my grandma. Never been to church before. Um, grandma said, you can wear whatever you want. She came dressed up completely, you know. Um, my grandma can't get up, so they brought communion to her, and they went out for lunch afterwards. And she goes, what was that white stuff they gave you, you know? And so my grandma uh, is explaining the liturgy, explaining the gospel, explaining all of this stuff about Easter and Good Friday. And, um, and I said, well, you wonder why you're still here. And she goes... Well, I know. People keep saying that to me. <laughs> but the point is, I bring all this up. I love Mike. She's an incredible lady. She has a friend who's Mormon, and she calls and tells her that she's going to hell. And I say, Grandma. And she goes, well, someone has to. <laughs> no one else is doing it. And what is that? What's wrong? I'm going to be gone soon anyways. She thinks she's going to be around for another 11 years or something. Uh, but my grandma, she doesn't fear death because she doesn't have to. See? No, we're not saying here, don't be afraid, you know, it might hurt, you know, something, you know. But the point is, for the Christian, you need not fear that. And when you stop looking to Christ and other things start to get in your ears and, and in your heart, you start to leave your first love and the promises of the gospel, that's when these things, the fear sets in. And so fear is, in this sense, something to be repented of. The reason I'm afraid is because I'm not trusting Christ the way I should. And you might say, but it's scary. Yeah, but that's just proof that we're not actually as faithful as we think we are. It's all the more reason to, to, to repent. See? And so I think that's kind of the, the thing we see here. However, you know, when someone's afraid, you notice how Jesus treats them. He doesn't say, repent of your fear or else, because like, that's the last thing you know, they need. It's, it's sort of a, look, you're afraid, 
but I've got promises for you. This is this is how you deal with the fear. It's not um, repent or else, but sort of you've forgotten the promises. So let's fill your ears back up with the promises and not turn you back in on your fear. Does that make sense? Okay, so very interesting stuff here. I think I mentioned to you one time about a, a quote from Martin Luther. Mm-hmm. He was asked about why he doesn't worry about the tomorrow or the future. Mm-hmm. And he said, I only have two days on my calendar. That's good. Yeah, that's that's a good, good loser line too. He lives that way. Yeah, that's good. Don't worry about the rest. Of the and there's in between. It's taken care of. And it's well. And in fact, it, the the day of judgment is taken care of too. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the reason why you have no reason to fear. Because the thing the devil wants you to fear most in your death is either the existence of God, the resurrection of Christ, or that the resurre- Ultimately, I mean, for us, the doubt's going to be: Was the resurrection for me? Was the cross for me? Do I have that hope? How do I know? And, and, and that's where you, you cling like crazy to your baptism and you cling like crazy to the communion you've received and you cling like crazy to the promises and the word um, because that's exactly where the devil doesn't want you to go in those moments. Believing. That's right. Well, if you think clear back to the garden, mm. to, to me the, the real start of the sin was when Adam and Eve it had nothing to do with eating the fruit of had to do with lack of trust in what God had said. Yeah, that's right. The original sin is lack of trust. That's right. It's, so, it's, you know, that's what the devil is always trying to do. If he can okay. get you to completely deny God, that's great. But all he's got to do is start putting that... That's right. Did down. God really say yeah. And just keep poking away... Yeah, that's good. ...at, at trust. That's right. There's questions in your mind if you're illegitimate. Yeah. Well, Which is why John says he's a, a liar. In the that's right. Exactly right. Because and and a an accuser. I, I mentioned this on Sunday. The the word devil is here, right? And verse ten, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for ten days. Uh, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The word devil, it, it comes from the Greek word. This is actually a, worth knowing. I I think uh, diabolos. All right. Uh, it, that is a combination word there in Greek. Balo is the Greek for to throw. So it's easy to remember. It's the Greek word that's easy to remember. Ball, throw, get it? Balo. Um, Balo means to throw. And when you say dia, it's a, it's a preposition that can mean either through or against. And so the devil is one who throws accusations against you. He's an accuser, you see. So you think of Job. And this is... A, this is always the part of Job we miss, I, I think. The devil comes before God somehow. You know, what are you doing here, you rascal? And the devil, and God says to Job, remember God says to the devil, have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen that guy? God like can't stop boasting about his children. He's like, he's thrilled with them. He's like, oh, here's my enemy. Look at this one. He pulls out the wallet, has the kids, you know, the phone now. And, and, jo- and the devil says what? He starts to accuse Job. Well, yeah. Of course he was great, because you're so nice to him. If you weren't that nice to me, you know, fine. Um, <laughs> that's not what he said, because he probably knew the answer that was coming from that one. But the idea is, look, you're that nice to him, of course. And so he starts to accuse him. He's not as faithful as you think. Or think of the priest Joshua in the book of Zechariah. There, uh, he's standing before God, and the devil is there accusing. The devil is an accuser. And so the devil wants the accusations to go to God, but does God listen to the devil's accusations against you? No. So where is he hurling his accusations? At you. And so he's coming at you and he's saying, you're too sinful for heaven. Therefore, God won't let you in. Now, here's how the devil works, because there's a half truth there. Are you too sinful for heaven? Yeah. And it's, yeah, but will God let you in? Yeah, because of the blood of Christ. Notice, the devil loves to talk theology so long as Christ isn't involved. Right. I'm going to tweet that out later, Dave. What's that? That's yeah. the entire premise of the screw tape letter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Most of the, screw tape letter. Yep. the whole thing is about a, a junior tempter, you know, saying, uh, and a senior tempter teaching him how to throw that stuff. Yep, that's right. Keep throwing that. Yep, it's a great picture, I think. Yeah. Um, and so, something's going to stick. Except in that one, it doesn't, which is yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the delight of the story. Um, but yeah, the devil's going to throw everything he can, and the accusations are what really... In the, in the large catechism, 
Luther says for the mature Christian, there's sort of, this is in the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, and he's talking about lead us not into temptation, I think. And he says there's three levels of temptation. For the younger Christian, it's going to be sort of the temptations of the flesh, just your typical run-of-the-mill temptations. Um, for the, the more mature Christian, it's going to be power, might, grown-up kind of sin things, you know. Uh, but then for the, the Christian who's been in it for a while, and the real faithful one, whatever that means, Luther says the temptations are going to be from the devil accusing you, causing you to question your salvation. The, the accusations. Are you really saved? Is Christ's blood really enough for you? Don't you think you ought to contribute something? Uh, do you believe enough? Have you repented sincerely? These are the questions. The devil loves adverbs, right? Have you repented? Yes. Sincerely, right? <laughs> Have you believed? Yeah. Truly? With all of your heart? The devil loves adverbs. See, no, 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 no. It's not so much, have you believed fully, but has Christ given himself to you? That's the question. And the devil will turn it back in on you. So, so these are the things just to be aware of. You know, when it comes to the devil, uh, for we who are not facing persecution of this nature, because that kind of persecution can come too, and the devil's behind that. But for us, it's more along those lines of these spiritual attacks of, of the bottom line. Did God really say? So the devil's going to come along and you're going to go through 10 days, whatever this means, of tribulation. Did God really say you would endure to the end? Did God really say he was with you through the valley of the shadow of death? Because it doesn't look like it right now. See, does that make sense? Okay. So what is the 10 days, Ron? What do you think? Did you, did you figure it out yet? It's a week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> it's... It's next Saturday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ten's a significant number. Ten's a significant number. Why? I think we mentioned it. Maybe we haven't. Number three, five, seven, six. Ten. Ten. Ten is fullness, completeness. The number of fingers you have. also perfection. What's that? Seven is is also completed or right. Perfection. But but seven is more. And we, you know, I don't know this all quite yet. But seven has more to do with God. So it's a God number. Oh. Okay. Right. So. It's a combination of God and creation. Yeah, and, and God completing things, things being finished, right? So seven trumpets and then the end. Seven plagues and then the end, or scrolls and then it comes to an end. So seven is God completing his works. Ten is a number of, it's just fullness or complete. So the, the, the a thousand years, that's nice good. Round. The thousand year reign is ten times three, right? So... 10 times 10 times 10, 10 to the third power. That's what I meant. Thank you. Yeah. That's 30, Dave. Come on. You're, I didn't, I don't teach math for a reason. Yeah. 10 times 10 times 10, uh, 10 to the third power is a thousand. So there's a divine sort of thing there, but the 10 means completeness or the 144,000, right? Is it derivative? What's the word? So you can divide there, it by so 10. Times 1,000 again. Right, it's 1,000. So, so it's a complete time. So, but 10 is significant because it's not 1,000. In other words, you're going to suffer for a complete period of time, but it's not going to be 1,000 years, something like this. You should expect a short but complete persecution for 10 days. It, little 10 days, maybe, but if the persecution ended on day 9 or 11, is Jesus lying? No. See? The point is there's going to be a time of persecution for you. So be ready for it. And this is very important. We are saved through the cross that we bear or through suffering. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. God doesn't say we're going to rescue you from the valley of the shadow of death. But we go through the valley of the shadow of death. And while we are in it, we fear no evil. It's not a theology of glory here that says Christ is going to take all your problems away. That's not the case. In fact, again, I was just reading this today, so this is why it's on my mind. But Luther says in the large catechism, he says, wherever the cross is preached, the, uh, wherever uh, Jesus is preached, the cross won't be far behind. You should expect the devil to come attacking. You should expect attacks. It's just the pattern of the New Testament. It's just the way it is. We're going to preach through First Thessalonians here uh, in a few weeks, starting this week. And it's going to be about a church that needs to look to the end for hope because it's going to go through hardships. And I thought, oh, that was what we did with First Peter. And that's what we're doing in Revelation. 
And oh, oh, that's what we're doing in the entire New Testament. Like the whole New Testament is written to churches who are suffering, awaiting the second coming, right? Because right now we're in the valley and we're waiting for the still waters and green pastures and all that kind of stuff. Um, those things are promised, but not yet. Ron, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say I've always trusted in three days because Christ went three days after he died and confronted the devil mm-hmm. and then came back. Right. Ten days sounds like an earthly thing where he's saying that we humans are going to have tribulations or suffering mm. for 10 days. Yeah, for 10 days. But I, I just don't think you want to take it as a literal 10 well, You can. I don't think there's... Nothing is won or lost here if it's a literal 10 days or a, a symbolic 10 days. The point is, there's going to be a period of suffering here for you. Yeah. Um, and in the overall scheme of things, it's relatively short compared to... Yes. Yeah. Yes, correct. It, this is... It's not going to be... It, it will come to an end. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, since you're talking numerology now, Uh-oh. I read something and I cannot figure out where I saw it. And I can't find it again. That the number one thousand in Greek was the largest number in their vocabulary, which I find hard to believe. But have you, as a student of the language, come across that? Yeah, I think so. I think that's right. Um, I, I have a place I can look to find out for you. The problem is we come across the one hundred forty-four thousand, um, but they don't deal in terms of millions. Yeah. So thousands, I think, is sort of like when you talk to the kids and you're like, it's going to be like trillions of dollars. The thousand would sort of be the Greek equivalent of, of that. Oh, gazillion. Very large. Yeah, gazillion, right. I think so. I, I have a place I can look and I'll, okay. I'll get it to you. I can't find it again. Yeah, I've, I've heard that somewhere before too. I can't recall where it was though. I'll find that. Okay. Um, good. Uh I want to read to you, um, well, let's just do this real quick. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Picture here not so much a royal crown as much as the uh, laurel wreath of the Olympians. Uh, Endure this and you will get the victor's crown, something like that. I think that's what we want to have in mind here because we think royalty. Now, incidentally, that royalty language will be used. You will reign with Christ for all these, this time or whatever. But here I don't think that the, that's the picture. The picture, the cr- word for crown here, I believe, is referring to the Olympian laurel wreath, something like oh, that. Athletic, athletic competitions, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, uh, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. We had a debate about this on Sunday morning, and I think I lost. Well, that's typical of my Bible studies, but I, I think the. the Second death, I have always understood that to be the day of judgment for those who are condemned eternally receive the second death. Marjorie Bly, though, had an interesting insight. She suggested it might be uh, actual dying and referred to the first death as baptism or when you convert. Uh, and that, that has New Testament precedent. Baptism is spoken of as the death and a resurrection. We're crucified and raised to a new life. That language does exist so that when you die, kind of we are just talking about my grandma. Remember my grandma who really wants to die. <laughs> I just love saying it. Um, I don't. That was not what I meant. But my grandma, when she says this, she doesn't fear her second death because in a sense she's already died with Christ and been raised to a new life. So whether you, so think of Romans 14, whether you live or you die, you belong to the Lord. So that death is not something to be feared. Now, maybe it's that, or it's the day of judgment. Either way, the point here is you don't have to be afraid of any death, whichever it is. Um, Later on, we'll talk about the second death when we get to Revelation uh, 20, and that'll shed more light on it, probably. Um, I I think that... You think that's speaking of the day of judgment there? Yeah, and if that's the case... It it might be. um, uh, Those who haven't been baptized... Reborn. Well, into Christ, they still have that second death coming. I think it's speaking more yeah. the day of judgment, and it's the end of any yeah. chance for God's grace. That second death is different to the for unbeliever and the unbeliever. I think that that makes the argument for what Dave's saying. Then that everyone dies; it's given everyone die once, and then you get that second death coming. Yeah, Which maybe so. Yeah, the, final separation. the judgment. Either way, I think the thrust of it is you don't have to fear the judgment of God when you die. And that judgment's been taken care of by Christ. See, 
Um, so if you endure to the end, if you die in this 10-day period, you don't have to be afraid because the judgment has been taken for you by Jesus who died and rose for you. I want to read you something. Uh, just means you'll be delivered from it. This is from the martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna in 155 uh, AD. So roughly 60 to 70 years after this book was written, um, this guy Polycarp uh, was martyred. and He was the pastor there, basically. Uh, Let's see. And he was 86 years old, which means there's a good chance he read John's letter. Very interesting to think about, right? Good chance he's talked to John. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So... So Polycarp is preaching Christ, and this makes the imperial cult folks mad. And so they send out for him because he's leading people away from worship of Caesar, and he's leading people to to worship Christ. And so they send guys for him. Now he goes away. He gets out of town. I want to read you the account of his arrest and his martyrdom. Um, And this is what happens. Um, So on the day of preparation, remember he's 86 years old, mounted police with their usual arms, set out about supper time, taking with them the servant hurrying as against the thief. Uh, Just real quick, uh, Polycarp has had a dream, and I do need to preface this, he's had a dream that he's going to be burned in flames, he's going to die by fire, all right? Uh, And this is after they find out that they want to arrest him. They take him to a farm, and I think they're kind of hiding him in a barn or someone's upper room or something like this. Um, And so the police are now looking for him. At a late hour, they came up to the place and found him in a cottage lying in an upper room. He could have gone away to another farm, but he would not, saying the will of God be done. He had the dream. He knows it's God's will for him to be martyred, so so he's not running away anymore. So hearing their arrival, I love this, he came down and talked with them while all that were present marveled at his age and constancy and that there was so much ado about the arrest of such an old man... (laughs) This is great. Then he ordered that something should be served for them to eat and drink at that late hour as much as they wanted. So here come these guys to take him and burn him on a stake. And before they go, he's like, well, we should probably eat. You guys want some, you want some dinner? Are you hungry? This is great. So he wins them over. And he besought them that they should grant him an hour that he might pray freely. They gave him leave, and he stood and he prayed, being so filled with the grace of God that for two hours he could not hold his peace. While they that heard were amazed, and the men repented that they had come after so venerable an old man. Uh, When he had brought to an end his prayer, in which he made mention of all, small and great, high and low, uh, with whom he had had dealings in the whole Catholic Church throughout the world, the time had come for him to depart. And they set him on an ass and led him into the city. Now it was the high Sabbath, and there met him the sheriff, uh, the sheriff Herod, and the father nice seats. Now it's okay. Let's let's skip down here. Uh, now, as he was entering into the stadium, there came to Polycarp a voice from heaven. Oh no! Excuse me. There's something else I wanted to discuss. I skipped something here. Okay, so so okay, so they're about to take him away, uh, but they like him, and so they say, "Now, what harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar?" Why don't you just say Caesar's Lord? Look, you're a nice guy. We love the, the food. Just just deny it. We'll let you go. You can die in your old age. We're not going to shame you. Just say Caesar's Lord. You don't even have to believe it. This is sort of the thing that's going on here, right? And in offering incense and so on, and thus saving himself, he at first made no reply, but since they persisted, he said, I do not intend to do what you advise. Then failing to persuade him, they began to use threatening words, and they pulled him down hastily, so that he grazed his shin as he descended from the carriage, without turning back as if he had suffered no hurt. He went on with all speed and was led to the stadium, wherein the tumult was so great that no one could be heard. Now as he was entering the stadium, there came a voice from heaven saying, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. And no one saw the speaker, but the voice was heard by those of our people who were there. Thereupon he was led forth, and great was the uproar of them that heard that Polycarp had been seized. Accordingly, he was led before the proconsul who asked him if he were the man himself. When he confessed, the proconsul tried to persuade him, saying, Have respect for thine age, and so forth, according to their very customary form. Swear by the genius of Caesar, repent, say, away with the atheists. Now remember, in the early church, Christians were called atheists 
because they would not worship the gods. They didn't consider Caesar to be God. They would not worship Zeus or any of these people, okay? So they were considered the atheists. So this, is, this line is phenomenal. Uh, say, repent, away with the atheists. So then Polycarp looked with a severe countenance on the mob of lawless heathen in the stadium, and he waved his hand at them. And looking up to heaven, he groaned and said, away with the atheists. This is great. So they're saying, denounce your faith. And he turns to everyone else and says, away with you atheists. You know, it's just, now he's asking for it, you know. But the proconsul urged him and said, swear and I will release thee, curse the Christ. And here's the line. And Polycarp said, 80 and six years have I served him and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Just great stuff. Um... And so then it goes on and he goes through this whole trial and they, they set him up to be lit on fire. Um, the firemen lighted the fire and a great flame flashed forth and we to whom it was given to see beheld a marvel. The fire took the shape of a vault like a ship's sail bellying into the wind and it made a wall around the martyr's body. And there was the body in the midst of like a loaf baked or like a gold and silver being tried in the furnace. So at length, the lawless one, seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, bade the executioner approach him to drive in a dagger. And when he had done this, there came out a dove, that may have been added later, most likely, and an abundance of blood so that it quenched the fire. And all the multitude marveled at the great difference between the unbelievers and the elect. So here is what John is describing actually taking place. You're going to suffer. And notice what Polycarp does. He doesn't back down. He endures to the end, and, and at the end of this, it, you know, he receives the crown kind of idea here. What did you read from? This is documents of the Christian Church. Um, I got a number of these, just sort of collections of documents. That was, um, I think, the name of that is just the martyrdom of Polycarp. I don't, I don't recall who wrote it, um, but there you go. Some of the things described in that story. Sound familiar? Yeah. To another situation some 150 years before. Yeah. Like in the garden, you said maybe. Yeah, and, and some of this is, there, there's always suspicion with these church fathers. They're trying to see themselves in light of the New Testament, which is the right thing to do. And so some people think, well, look, a dove flying out of him, I mean, probably not. And the blood putting out the fire, maybe that's a little well, poetic inside there. Using to. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. And take us a final go and, you know, and, and wrestling and saying, thy will be done. That's right. That's exactly right. No, no, you're exactly right, Norm. This, this idea of Polycarp and the church so identifying itself with yeah. Christ that when persecution comes, they don't say, you know what? We're going to fight for our rights. But instead, all right, this is the Lord's will. Let's go. Yeah. Um, now, that's interesting that, to note. Paul does, well, Paul does fight for his rights, but that's because he believes God is sending him to Caesar. He's trying to get to Rome. Yeah. Um, and so there's a little bit... And he's also an apostle who has dreams from God. So there's, you know, some difference there. Uh, and he's also got this really special gift of uh, of gab. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And if he has any chance of getting the ear of the emperor... He's going to do it, he's right. He's guy that can do it. Yeah, so Polycarp is a little different. But just notice, I, I think you're exactly right here, how Polycarp... and, and in 1 Thessalonians this Sunday, when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he says he's amazed at their, their imitating him and Jesus. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're just really nice guys in, there in Thessalonica who help old ladies across the street. What it means is, in the face of persecution and trial, your confession stands firm. You don't back off. Right. That's it's the same thing with Polycarp. It's what Christ is in exhorting the church in Smyrna to do. It's what Jesus himself does. I mean, this is the pattern of the church. When persecution arises, you don't back off the confession. You stand firm. Right. More evidence of being connected to the true vine. Correct. Exactly right. Very good. All right. Good. On Sunday, on Sunday we had Bible study. Um, and we were, what, what king was it that had the, I forget the name of the king now. I get those guys all confused. They all sound like, they all sound singing. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, Anyway, um, but they they, um, they they had a group of people there, and they were talking about bow, okay, mm -hmm. All right? And they wanted to know, well, which one's more powerful, your God or, or bow? And they said, well, make two altars. They made two altars. Ahaz, yeah. Ahab. 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 Ezekiel and Ahab, Ahab yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. 
so they make so they make two altars, right? Yeah. And they said, and put wood around them and everything, mm -hmm. and say, okay, um, pray to your God and have him start the fire. Yeah. And and of course he doesn't. And then Ahab's people actually pour water this on was the Elijah. wood. Huh? Elijah. Was it Elijah? Elijah the prophet. Yeah. yeah. It was Elijah. It was Elijah who poured the water on. And then it's still, and then it started on fire. Yeah. Well, my reason for saying that is, don't discount the dove. It, it, you know, it, weird things have happened. Well, right, and then sort of, I mean, you, you sort of get this. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty good connection there, because then Polycarp's blood puts out the flame. You know, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's interesting. There goes the wrath. Yeah. That's a great. Uh, that's the story that the kids all like until the, you know. That's the part they leave out afterwards when. Um, Elijah says, now go find all those prophets of Baal and slaughter them. Yeah. Uh, this, they don't put that part in the kid's Bible. Yeah, yeah they don't. Yeah. Or, or Jezebel is left in the desert for the bones. Yeah, to eat, right. Or for the dogs to eat. Dogs. Yeah, dogs. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about Jezebel in, in nine weeks when we get to the Thyatira, the end of chapter two, because um, her name comes up. But yeah. Oh, good old Elijah. Yeah, okay. So here you have this. This is kind of the idea here. And I think that, that Polycarp story is very... Um, enlightening as to sort of here's what John is no what's interesting I mean is just how, how close that is to, I, I think it's kind of fun to think about just how close and what an impact this letter is making right off the bat early in the church 155 is not late in, in the scheme of things you know so here's a guy who's actually connected to John in this very close way go ahead Dave well in some respects it actually bothers me because we live in a relatively mild society, in spite of some of my comments on Facebook and so forth. But we're not under much persecution, really. Mm -hmm. you know? So I begin to wonder just how strong we really are. And, and, and I'm saying that from a personal standpoint. How strong am I, really? Mm -hmm. If somebody came up and put a gun to my head, what would happen? Yeah, right, right. Well, we've got Christians and brothers and sisters in the Middle East now. Yeah. In Syria, they're suffering that kind of sure. barbaric and do, do, What would we even... The women we, we can't even conceive of... Oh, it was it, I, I haven't... I, Iraq, right? Where they're saying, all right, if you worship Christ, you need to be out by this date or you won't... or we will kill you. That's the ISIS. Like, we can't even fathom... What that is, we have five pastors in Houston who have to turn their sermons into the mayor now, and we're all losing our minds, right? I mean, this is yeah. something to be afraid of, but it's, and I'm not even sure it's a true story, but it's, uh, it is interesting to think about. It's nowhere near the no. magnitude of what, for example, just this one yeah. example right. with Polycarp. Right. And there were many more. Besides yeah, this is the pattern of the early church. You have Polycarp, you have, um, oh, who's the, there's one lady who is martyred. Ah, oh, wow. And hers is still. I mean, she goes singing mm -hmm. to her per, to her trial. I mean, she goes and singing hymns. It's it's phenomenal. Um, the Chinese. Oh heavens! I, I, my, I have a buddy who's. You guys saw um, *Chariots of Fire*. Uh, who's the runner? Eric Liddell. You know. Who, you know the story *Chariots of Fire*. He's never saw the movie *Chariots of Fire*. Yeah. I didn't, so I shouldn't make fun of you. Yeah. Uh, Eric Liddell was the great Christian um, Olympian. Really fast guy. Uh, but it refused to run in his event on Sunday, and so they made a movie about it in Chariots of Fire. He's like the Sandy Koufax of the running world, I guess. Um, but he, but Eric Liddell ended up going back to China and doing mission work there. And I have a buddy in um, in Florida who's doing a, making a movie out of this thing. He's set a script, sent it in, all kinds of stuff. But I, I think it was there in China where they would go, they would put these people in concentration camps and they would just sing hymns the whole night, you know, and, and people couldn't believe it. Or it was um, also in, um, uh, oh, it's an African country. Uh, oh, heavens. Nigeria? No, it's not Nigeria. It's... Liberia? No, northern, I think. Somalia? No. Kenya? What'd you say? Kenyan? No. <laughs> I'm not going to remember. It's fine. <laughs> we tried. Tanzania. But we're, no, uh, it'll come to me. I can picture all their art. I can picture all this. In there was a there was a period where they had a queen who was just evil. She would just slaughter the Christians. But so many people converted there because as the Christians were going to their slaughter, they would go in singing hymns. And now it's like the largest Lutheran population in the world. 
in this country, and I can't think of the name of it. Um, but it's just interesting to think about the way that they face martyrdom as something to be embraced, where we sort of face martyrdom as fear, fear or something that we we try and work up. Yeah. You know, we try and pretend like we have it so we can sort of feel validated. Uh, it's just not the way it works. See, I don't think we truly understand verse 10. Do not be afraid. Yeah. I think you're right. You know, those are powerful words to somebody like Polycarp and, and uh, yeah. you know, Peter, Paul. Coming from the mouth of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Or, or the word of God, that voice from heaven. Play the man, Polycarp. Understand the whole power. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It, it goes. It goes against um, who we are as humans. Yeah. The, the unknown. The unknown is scary. It's it's scary. Though. It's, it's, it's human nature. You call it called genetic engineering or whatever. You want. I mean, it, it's it's who we are as humans. Mm-hmm. And so God says to us, have faith. And and we humans, even with without absent the devil, are going to say, yeah, I'll try. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. But that's scary. Right. Yeah. 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 So and so, this is we'll see this uh, in in Pergamum when we eventually get there. This sort of all right. We don't have to be afraid because we can also worship the other gods, right? We can also still play fast and loose with the world, where there's a little more comfort than this word that says one thing, but I can't see it with my eyes, or I don't experience it. Um, so it's easier for me to cling to. Like in Pergamum, for example, they have. Um, let's see, it's it's where Satan's throne is. Is what it says. Um, it's easier so we'll get there but there's there's a lot of false worship in Pergamum and to fit into the culture and the society and make sure you have a job and make sure you can go buy groceries and stuff like this you have to worship the false gods and so what they're doing there in Pergamum probably is something along the lines of saying well look if we just sort of capitulate to the culture a little bit we don't have to be afraid about where our next meal is coming from God's promise to give us daily bread. He's prov- promised to provide us manna from heaven. He's promised this kind of stuff. But we can also just kind of take matters into our own hands. We, can help him out. we trust ourselves more than we trust him. And that's, that may lead to a little false worship, but don't worry, we're saved by grace. Right? And, and this is where that false, like, that false worship, that idolatry creeps in. And the reason we run to idols is because there's a lot more initial or immediate comfort in an idol. Because you can grab it, you can grasp it, you can manipulate it. Um, so yeah I mean think about how tempting this is for Polycarp right look just say Lord Caesar those are two words your eternity doesn't hang on these two words that you don't even believe yeah you don't have to believe right just say it we'll let you go home die happy you can play with the grandkids on your knee I mean think about it that's it's tempting stuff and Polycarp says why would I deny the Lord who's been faithful to me for 86 years Especially when I know, I mean, and so, because Christ is the beginning and the end. The end is not grandkids bouncing on the knee. Even beautiful grandkids bouncing on the knee can be an idol. See? And so that's, that's where it gets really difficult. And that, again, so that's, Dave, I think you're absolutely right. We don't grasp what's actually at stake here with some of these things. You know? It depends on the grandkid. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, you got some that are at idols? <laughs> No, he's saying no. He <laughs> Some of that aren't. Yeah. Okay. Um, you might want to delete that. For yeah, this. Uh, Luke 12 uh, is probably worth looking at. I mean, we'll finish here. We're not going to get to Pergamum. It's, it's not worth it tonight. Uh, but Luke 12, I want to read these words here. These are very helpful, I think, or, or not. Who knows? Uh, Luke 12, 4 through 7. I tell you, friends, Jesus speaking here, do not fear those who kill the body, and after they have nothing more that they can do and after that have nothing more they can do but I will warn you whom to fear fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell yes I tell you fear him now who is he referring to there God it's not the devil who casts you into hell it's to God and so we say well that's a very scary picture of God but notice the the very next thing Jesus says are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them forgotten before God? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not; you are of more value than many sparrows. So, 
I, I read Jesus saying this here. Look, you will be persecuted. He's just saying, beware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're going to come for us. Clearly, they're going to come for Jesus. We'll see him come for the disciples later. We're seeing this in Smyrna. Uh, they will kill you. Don't be afraid of them. Don't back down. Don't start worshiping what they want you to worship. All right? Don't fear them. Fear God. No, who's the God you fear? Look, he's the one who's going to care for you. He's the one who loves you. But if you reject that love because you're so afraid of how bad the Pharisees can hurt you, then that God is someone to be feared. You, then he is, now you are rejecting him. That's something to be terrified of. Dying a painful death, being persecuted, that's going to come. Don't be afraid of that. The greater fear is what God does later. But remember, he's the one who has compassion and has love and has mercy and forgives and, and knows the numbers of hair on your head. Norm, you and I, that's not a big number. But that's, you know, he gets the idea there. You see what I'm saying? So, well, the choice is either eternity with or without him. That's, that's right. And, and so, of hell is eternally separated. And so whatever these guys can do to you is nothing yeah. compared to the glories that you can look forward yeah. to. But also, the flip side is also true. The glories that are not there uh, for those who reject God. See? He's stuck in that eternal state of loss with them. <laughs> I just think it's a, not yeah, it's a very interesting pile of verses right there. Because it's about as scary as it gets in the first part. And then the last part is one we all cling to. In fact, someone on Sunday said on the way out, that's my favorite one, you know. Um, we were talking about that in the sermon, what's your favorite verses. Someone says, fear not for you are, uh, he knows the numbers of hair on your head. Um, it's put in a very interesting context right there. The point there is, we are to fear love and, you know, fear love and trust God above all things. And not fear and love and trust our own life. Whoever loves his life will lose it. That kind of language there. All right, so um, it's the same theme throughout. He's warning us, telling us the truth. Being a Christian is hard, and there will come trials and tribulations and tests. But the glory that's promised beyond the test is, is phenomenal. Like, like they say, for the believer, this is as bad as it could ever get. Sure. For the unbeliever, this is as good as it could ever get. Think also of the... Um, the, the interesting end of the 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm is sort of a good matrix to read the rest of the New Testament through. I mean, but there's this, um, he, he sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Very interesting verse. We don't like to talk about that part of the Psalm either. Uh, but who am I being exalted among? Those who put me, you know, you think of these people who put Polycarp on trial. Now, is there mercy for them? Yeah, Christ died for them too, but they're rejecting it. And they're instead choosing to be on the team of the devil and the children of the devil and all this kind of stuff. Ah, and on the day of judgment, all their deeds will be there before them as a terrifying prospect. And they'll be on their knees as well. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, comforting. When I think of, the, when I think of don't worry, um, I actually think about the, just a little bit further on than that. Uh-huh. When he talks about the birds, you know, um, don't worry because the, the birds don't worry. And God feeds them. That's right. Takes care of them. I can see, I can, um, we can just, I can live in the sticks. And um, we can see a lot of birds. There's a lot of trees around my house. We can see a lot of birds out there, you know. And every time I see a bird, it, that's what I think of. I think, you know, God takes care of you. Yeah. He doesn't worry about it. That's right. The bird doesn't worry about it. The right. bird goes on being a bird. Yep, you that's know? right. He means um, the sticks because he doesn't rake the yard. Well, <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, that's, that's, and I think that's the attitude God wants me to take. Yeah. Be, like, be like the bird. Right. You know, don't worry about it. I'll, I'm, take, I'm in control. That's right. I'm taking that's care right. of things. And that's absolutely, that's right. That's the promise, right? Yeah. Um, and I will go home tonight and load up my bird feeders. They're empty right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We don't bother feeding because yeah. that's because Dave has a God complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that explains a lot. Maybe nine tomorrow, maybe not. Tomorrow, maybe not. Oh. I don't live in the sticks, and I got twenty-five turkey vultures that live outside my house, and I'm not all that thrilled with that Bible verse all yeah. the time. Um, <laughs> they're they're gone now for the year, so that's good. Okay, we'll call it good there. Um, should have never admitted being afraid of birds. <laughs> I know, I know. You're right. This should have never come out of my mouth. They, all got on the they hurt. And, and all, yeah. 
All right. Uh, so next week we'll go to Pergamum. I, I really thought we'd get further, so I, I hope you guys don't mind this thing going slow. It's just the nature of the beast, I guess. That's fine. Uh, it's good stuff anyways. Very important four verses. <laughs> four verses. Davis is amazing. Uh, next week we'll do Pergamum and, and potentially Thyatira, and then we'll get into the uh, chapter three. Okay? Uh, let's close with the, uh, with the um, doxology. <laughs> I sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.